Let me invite you to take a Bible and open it with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I want to express to you my appreciation for your presence and for the privilege of being able to address you this evening and direct our minds in a study of God's Word. When we've been there 10,000 years, what a fantastic idea that even after 10,000 years, we will have no less, day, less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. That is a wonderful idea for those who love and, and treasure God above all. There are many, many, many religious people asking a question. Where are young people going? What's happening to the young people in our culture, in our churches? Lifeway is a so-called Christian organization that has quickly become, over the last decade or so, one of the biggest pollsters for the evangelical church. And by that, we're talking about all of the different Protestant denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, and so on. Lifeway conducted a study over the course of the last 10 years asking the question of those Protestant denominations across a variety of different denominational lines, how many young people are leaving the church? And they took into account all different kinds of things that are designed to attract the attention of young people and keep young people interested and, and to be used to get them to a particular place so that maybe the focus can be turned toward God and how good God is. They took into account all of these different things that you see on the screen behind me. And after 10 years, Lifeway reported at the end of last year, that some 70% of the youth in evangelical churches left. They weren't there anymore. And they didn't just go from one denomination to another, but they were completely unaccounted for with only an estimated 35% of those, those young people eventually returning. A great many religious organizations are willing to try anything and everything to attract and keep young people. Now, I would suggest to you that studies like this, and this is not the only one that we could show, but studies like this show that you can do a variety of different things on a social and physical attraction level that might get the attention of young people for a little while, but young people grow. And as they're able to get out on their own and make their own choices, there are even trendier and, and cooler and more available places that will do trendier and more cool and more available, more cutting edge kinds of things than any religious organization can offer. And so if that is what has gotten my attention and that's what keeps my attention, I'll continue to chase that wherever it is that I might find it. We understand over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've been asking of ourselves, why are we here? There are so many different religious organizations all around us. Why does this church exist? And we've rooted that answer in the Bible. And especially this morning, we rooted our answer in the idea that we exist for the Word of God. We exist to be directed by the Word of God. You don't need me to tell you that these are modern day innovations, many of them gimmicks to get the attention of people. And we understand just from a logistic point of view, this church can't possibly compete with what World Harvest a few miles away can offer as far as these kinds of things are concerned. But that's good news because that's not our calling. That's not why we exist. 
We're doing our best to, to root those kinds of answers biblically, seek our answers biblically as to why we exist. You've got your Bibles open there to John chapter 6. I would suggest to you this is not a new phenomenon. These are modern statistics. It's a modern study. These are modern ways that people's attention are grabbed and will get you a following for a little while. But this is not a new phenomenon. This is not a new question as to how we are going to do the work of God in God's ways with godly motives. Jesus dealt with this idea. Did you know that? You've got your Bibles open there to John chapter 6 and the 26th verse of the chapter. John chapter 6 and verse 26 of the chapter. Jesus, in talking with some of the people who have gathered around Him a great multitude, He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking Me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And as you look around in your Bibles, what's going on there? Jesus has just fed more than 5,000 people. And we understand, we've talked before about the purpose of those miracles. There are many, many, many things that Jesus did that we're not able to recreate. And we're not called to recreate. He was empowered as deity to do these things to show the message, however difficult it is to hear and digest and, and eventually apply, this message is worth listening to. That There is something greater going on here than just the words of the ideas of any man. And so Jesus and, and later the apostles and representatives of God are empowered to do incredible things that get people's attention, drawing their attention ultimately to the message of the gospel. And Jesus brings up this question that has plagued mankind for now 2,000 years. Here you are and you're interested in what you got, but you're not interested in what you need to be interested in. This is about more than loaves. If you're interested in the loaves, you missed the point altogether. Do not labor, verse 27, for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him God the Father has set His seal. Jesus goes on to deliver a great message for those whose hearts are interested in Him. This message of being the bread of life that came down from heaven. But we see by the end just of this chapter the result in the hearts of many. The food attracted a great many people. Jesus says you're missing the point. This is about the message. You need to labor for the food that will not perish. Let me tell you how I am the bread of life that fulfills your greatest need. Verse 66 of John chapter 6, after this, many of His disciples turned back and walked no longer with Him. If you're not going to give us that, we're not interested. If you're not going to continue to give us bread, we'll find bread somewhere else because that's really why we are here. Jesus turns to the twelve and He asks them, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. As young people grow up and mature, why do they remain faithful to God? There isn't any solution for bringing back young people that have wandered away. We continue to pray as we did even this very evening. But as we look at those who remain faithful, 
Why do they remain faithful? And we've earmarked number one up at the top of that screen. Young people remain faithful to God because they have heard the gospel. Number one. Young people do not remain faithful to God because of gymnasiums. There's always a newer one out there. Always a better material to have on the floor. Always better lighting. Young people don't remain faithful because of pizza and cheeseburgers. They'll take that while they can get it as they're growing up and they don't have wheels of their own and they don't really have a choice. But as soon as they go on, on their way, out on their own, if that is what has captured their heart, if that is what has attracted and kept their attention, there are plenty of places that offer those without any need to sit through any sort of a religious talk. Young people don't remain faithful because of video games or softball leagues or carnivals or raffles or, or concerts. Young people remain faithful to God, number one, because they've heard the gospel. It's the gospel according to Paul in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 that is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We turned our attention this morning to Hebrews chapter 4, the living and active Word of God. Young people remain faithful to the living God because they've heard the living and active Word. Word of God. In the language of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, they've heard this message that Christ suffered once for sins. And that's bigger than what I can eat. That's bigger than what I can play. That's bigger than, than anywhere that I can go. Christ suffered for my sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. And He did that, not that I might be entertained for an hour or two, not that I might have a meal that, that, that will last me for a couple of hours, not so that I can, can enjoy a particular concert or anything like that. Nothing wrong with that, but this is bigger, bigger than those ideas. Being put to flesh, being put to death in the flesh, God's own Son was made alive in the Spirit. I'd suggest to you that this is an area where we can learn from all of these different religious organizations who are trying those things and after a decade's worth of study are reaching the same conclusion. That might attract the attention of some young people and those things might keep the attention of some young people for a while. But three-fourths of the young people in this country who were raised in those Protestant denominations aren't there anymore. Young people remain faithful to God because they've heard the gospel. We turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Young people remain faithful to God because they have been convicted. They, they haven't just heard a message about what this one Jesus did 2,000 years ago, but they've heard that. The implications of that have been explained to them. It, it has settled down deep into their hearts. And what they are hearing them has convicted them. Again, we spend time in Hebrews 4 and verse 12. The Word of God is living and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to, to convict me. It pierces down into the innermost parts of my being, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And you know what happened in New Testament times when that Word of God was used effectively and it came in contact with those willing to respond to the message? That sharp, Two-edged sword cut people to the heart. Acts 2 and verse 37. That's what happened. There wasn't any concert. There weren't any ball games. There wasn't any food to speak of. It's not what 
attracted these people. There was a miracle undoubtedly that got their attention, but then they sat and they listened to a powerful God-breathed message. They heard it and it absolutely convicted them. This word sharper than a two-edged sword cut them to their heart. And you know what that means? Our aim as a church is to raise young people who hear the gospel. And they hear it in such a variety of different ways and a variety of different times from a variety of different people using it in a variety of different ways illustrating why we're here, why we exist, what life is all about. And the goal is to convict our young people. Any... 19, 20, 21, 22 year old who eventually gets out on his or her own who is not convicted is going to find something on the surface that looks more entertaining. Why do we lose young people? Because they're not convicted. Not deeply convicted in and of themselves. We turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Why do young people remain faithful? They've heard the gospel. They've been convicted. They, they haven't just watched other people, but they themselves have been convicted. And based on what they're hearing, they have adopted God's way of thinking as their own. If a young man or a young woman hears and, the, and they respond maybe initially and, and, and from an outward point of view things appear to be going exactly the way God would have it to go but then they get out on their own they're hundreds of miles away from home mom and dad aren't waking them up on Sunday morning or aren't nudging them in the direction of meditation and study and, and reading on God's Word taking advantage of the many opportunities that are available to establish faith and ground faith and build faith up I get out on my own and my faith is not my own and I will not remain faithful why do young people remain faithful they've adopted God's way of thinking as their own they, they've allowed passages like Colossians 3 to settle in personally if then you not your parents not your sibling, not, not your friends. If you have been raised with Christ, you seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. I would suggest to you this is very simple. If a young person hasn't died to self, he or she will not remain faithful to God. If a young person's mind is not set on things that are above, he or she will not remain faithful to God. Which means that our aim, our, our calling, our goal as parents is to raise children who understand there are so many different things that can grab your attention, but the greatest thing is God. Set your mind on God. Many of our children and our grandchildren are on the brink of going back to school. And many grandparents and parents are very anxious as children continue to get older and continue to make decisions on their own and decide who they're going to be and who they're going to spend their time with and, and what the rest of their lives are going to look like, who they're going to marry. All of these different major life decisions. Our calling as parents and grandparents is to show there is a better way not just to teach it, but to show by the way we are living, by the way we're prioritizing, 
This is what it looks like to have your mind set on things that are above. This is what it looks like to live a life where I have been crucified and Christ now lives in me. Same chapter, Colossians 3 and verse 9. I've put off the old self with its practices and I've put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. Why do young people remain faithful? They've heard the gospel. They've been convicted. They've come to adopt God's way of thinking as their own. And they have personally become a part of a network of saints. I was fascinated by something I read last month. And this is just a, a, a section. It, it was rather heady stuff. And this was just the, about the only section I could wrap my mind around, but I understood what was going on here. A study just released from the University of British Columbia where a graduate student uncovered the extent and the architecture of a network of trees in a forest. Through the use of new molecular tools that can distinguish the DNA of one fungal individual from another or of one tree's roots from another, he's found that all trees in dry interior Douglas fir forests, all of these trees are interconnected with the largest and the oldest trees serving as hubs much like the hub of a spoked wheel where younger trees establish within this network of the older trees through careful experimentation, recent graduate Francois Tess determined that several of these establishing trees was greatly enhanced when they were linked into the network of the old trees. God created life to be interconnected. And He created people to be interconnected. He created, in His wisdom, the church. And I'd suggest to you that just like those younger trees are established and they grow and, and they get nutrients and they grow stronger because they're connected to those much older trees, the church is the same way. You show me a church where the older, well-established members of that body are like hubs, and I'll show you a strong church. Where older, more established, more mature Christians create opportunities, having younger Christians in their home, getting to know younger Christians, talking with them about how we've been married for 40, 50 years and it wasn't always easy, but this is how it worked. This is how we've remained faithful to God and faithful to each other all of our lives. This is how through the ups and the downs, the, the intense joys and desperate heartaches and heartbreaks of life, we've been able to pass through those valleys. Let us tell you from experience how that works. We're further down the pathway of life than you are. And so give us the opportunity to look back and tell you how we got here. Why do young people remain faithful to God? Because they have personally, not because they ride in the same car as their parents and then just automatically out of habit decide they're going to take this kind of thing seriously. No, they personally become a part of a network of saints, very much like we were talking about last week on, on Sunday morning. Why do we exist? We exist to help us all persevere, to remain faithful. There's something to that. God repeatedly telling us to exhort one another. We're growing up in a holy forest in which we are to all be interconnected. 
We exist that we might be equipped for the work of ministry and have what we need to grow up and have others to, to suffer with and rejoice with and, and show the standard of God's Word so that we might evaluate our own lives and help other people see the truth that maybe they're blind to. Why do young people remain faithful? Because they are plugged in to something bigger than themselves. We turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 and the sixth verse of the chapter. Why do young people remain faithful? Because they believe in the importance of instructive and corrective discipline. Because they're willing to acknowledge they don't have all of the answers. Because they're willing to acknowledge sometimes there are some things that I didn't even think about. Because sometimes I, I put a picture on Facebook or a status update online or, or I said something in a group that I know now I, sh I shouldn't have ever said. But I didn't see it until someone loved me enough to, to get me to think about that. In Hebrews chapter 12, God talks about the discipline that we all need. Hebrews 12 and verse 6, The Lord disciplines the one He loves. Sometimes He does it through His Word. Sometimes He does it through my brothers and sisters who are grounded in this and are thinking more than I'm thinking. Sometimes He does it through elders who are asked, told by God to, to make sure that I stay in this pathway of holiness. Sometimes He does it through my parents. Sometimes He does it through friends. God can do it in a variety of different ways. The point is, He does it. The Lord disciplines the one He loves and He chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? We could ask very validly what son is there or daughter is there who does not need discipline. Telling me instructively before I make the mistake. You need to think about this. You need to think about where this pathway leads. From a corrective point of view, if I've already stepped down a pathway that I, I never should have started to begin with, God can instruct me and correct me in a variety of different ways. And I would suggest to you, the young people who are growing up and continuing to remain faithful to God, they're doing so because they understand the need for discipline. We turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. In an ongoing sense, young people remain faithful to God because they are being equipped for the walk of faith. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. God gave the apostles. We're holding their work in our hands. The work of the prophets. God gave those with a purpose in mind. The apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors, elders, overseers. He gave teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We exist as a local church to equip young and old, male and female for the work that God has designed us for. Young people remain faithful to God because they recognize there's a life to be lived here. There is work to be done. And I'm being equipped by parents, by grandparents, by my brothers and sisters in Christ who love me and care for me and are, are connected to me in Jesus. They're equipping me for what is most important in life. And I might strive to graduate high school and that's the end of my formal education. I might strive to graduate from college. I might strive for a doctorate. Whatever it is. But unless I'm equipped for this work, it is all a waste. This is the greatest work of all. Bible class teachers 
who sometimes I know grow to feel like I, I, I don't think anything is going on here. I don't think it's connecting on any level whatsoever. I'm not sure I see how all of this is going to work. Understand, you're doing one small part of what God has designed the church to do. From the earliest of ages... Down the hall, when we're just repeating over and over and over again, what's the Bible all about? Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. And Jesus is coming again. All the way through our high school classes and beyond. Why are we doing that? Because young people need to hear the gospel. And they need to be convicted. And they need to grow to adopt God's way of thinking as their own. And they need to become a part of something larger than themselves. They need to see the importance. See illustrated for them the role of God's discipline. And they need to be equipped for the walk of faith. Finally, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Why do young people remain faithful to God? I would suggest to you they remain faithful because their eyes are fixed on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. That's what this is all about. Do you see how this flows? We've been in Hebrews 3 and, and 4 all day long. But I want you to see the flow of this. Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Consider Jesus. Hebrews 3 and verse 13. Exhort one another. Speaks to the church. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And there's illustrations in the middle of all of that, but the point is a simple one. Remain faithful to God. How do you do that? Consider Jesus. Exhort one another. Use God's Word. Young people remain faithful to God because they have set their eyes on Jesus and they're seeing other people doing that. And they're seeing that God's way works and they're using God's Word and they've had it used. Their thinking has been shaped with the Word of God so that they might see Jesus all the more clearly. And they learn as they're growing up, our, our children and our grandchildren, these great stories of faith that are documented in Hebrews chapter 11, but it's ultimately all about fixing my eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You look down through that list that you've got in your bulletin, and I would suggest to you, humbly, lovingly, fearfully, as the father of three, that you begin to take those things out. And down the line, there won't be any faithfulness. Obviously, you remove the gospel, and there won't be faithfulness to God. You remove personal conviction, and there won't be faithfulness to God. You fail in adopting God's way of thinking as your own. And why would you do what God tells you to do? You, you fail to become plugged in, connected to something larger than yourself. You fail to appreciate the importance of instructive and corrective discipline. You fail to be equipped for the walk of faith. You take your focus off of Jesus and you won't remain faithful to our Father in Heaven. It's these kinds of things that need to shape why we do what we do as a church. 
We don't do in 2011 what we do as a church just because that's what we've always done ever since the late 70s. Lord willing, we won't continue to do 10 years from now what we're doing right now just because that's what we've always done. We do God's work in God's way because God said so in His Word and God's way works. You take your songbook out if you turn that to the song of encouragement that John has selected. Of course, these points apply to young and old. These apply to, to, to you if you know you yourself are alienated from God. There are some who didn't have the blessing of hearing about God and about His will at a, a very young age. And maybe you just began to pay attention to this whole idea when you were in your 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s. It begins with hearing the gospel. It begins with being convicted. We read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 that there were people who hear the gospel and they're cut to the heart with that sword that's sharper than any other and they ask, what shall we do? What shall we do? It begins with personal conviction. Whatever I've got to do to adopt God's way of thinking as my own, just tell me what to do. And Peter said, it begins with repentance. It is sin that separates me from God. You've got to cut off the pipeline of sin. You've got to turn away from that and pledge yourself to God. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that will lead you to become a part of a network of saints and lead you in the pathways of instructive and corrective discipline, lead you to be equipped. Continue to focus your eyes on Jesus. We want to stand and sing this song. And if we can help you in your faithfulness to God, we invite you to come to the front while we stand and sing.